I always joke that I don't have nightmares about public speaking. I have nightmares about my chemo not working. And this is why. But anyway, I'm Katie. I'm a freelance group front end designer from Derby. I work with local, small and startup businesses providing web design services. This year I've started to subcontract out to other freelancers who have the skills that I don't have so I can offer more services. I share a co-working space in the centre of Derby with an illustrator and two software developers. This week they've had the pleasure of coding JavaScript and jQuery for me and integrating Drupal into Mapbox's API. I also freelance for agencies throughout the country. I get to work on larger scale projects that I wouldn't necessarily win on my own. So I get the best of both worlds. I get to develop client relationships and add value to businesses, but I also get the invaluable experience of working with other developers and project managers. I work with a variety of agencies without any commitment, so I get to see what works well and what doesn't and apply it to my own business. I have a background in graphic design. I spent three years studying graphic communication, and according to my mum, I was always going to get a degree from scribbling. I spent six weeks on a project, and now I'm lucky to have six hours. I used to spend four weeks without touching the computer, so I graduated with no time of concept, money, or how to work on commercial briefs. Would I do my degree again? I probably would, because I loved the creative freedom and I learned how to play, but it was definitely a shock when I entered the real world. I dabbled in web design as a hobby, but I swore it wasn't the career for me. I wanted to design cool things like CD covers and book jackets. I had a background in access databases from A-levels, but it was something that I didn't think I could do for the rest of my life. But unfortunately, on the first day of uni, we were told that one in ten would get a job, and there were 45 of us. So three years later, just before the recession hit, when I got offered a job as a new media designer in Derby, I took it. I was trained one-on-one -on -one in Drupal. They were using 4.7 and 5 back then, but whilst I was there, we made the switch to 6. The company were a print agency that decided they ought to keep up to date with technology and offer web design as a service, but they didn't really have the capacity or the understanding. After a year, I was made redundant along with most of the workforce, and now their focus has gone back to print. During my year there, I hardly had any client interaction apart from the odd email. I was given A4 briefs on pieces of the paper and I never once sat in a client meeting. I never took responsibility for my work and I didn't understand that time was money. So going freelance was a big move for me and a huge risky strategy. I did try and look for another job but because it was a high of recession I couldn't find anything suitable. A friend of mine told me I had nothing to lose if I went freelance and failed so why didn't I give it a go? I googled Start Your Own Business Derby and I found a program at the University of Derby called The Enterprise Inc. The course provided workshops, lectures, business mentors and a grant. There were 50 businesses on the course and in my year I was the only designer, so I slowly began to pick up clients. From these initial clients, four years on, my business, business has grown purely by word of mouth and Twitter. I was fortunate enough to swim, but it hasn't been an easy four years. I've slowly grown quickly and quickly learned from my mistakes. If I had my time again, I'm not sure I'd go freelance with so little experience. It definitely has been a difficult learning curve. Surprisingly, as much as I hate the word passion, one of my passions now is client relationships. Hopefully this is one of my selling points, and this is where the idea of the forgotten user comes from. The last time I did this talk, I was down in Brighton at the Reasons to Be Creative. I was one of 18 elevator pictures, and in an hour, we all had three minutes to deliver our talk to a room full of people at the Brighton Dome. I was so pressed for time, I even considered not mentioning my name because I wanted to get my point across. So I'm looking forward to talking a little slower and actually introducing the inspiration behind the idea, develop my ideas, and show more techniques and solutions as designers and developers we can use, and also how we can use in relation to Drupal. So what exactly is a forgotten user? As web designers and developers, we spend time thinking about the end user. We think about how they will navigate our websites and perform functions like adding products to shopping baskets and how easy a call of action button is to be seen. We ensure the websites we build achieve their intended goals. We consider user experience, but I believe we're forgetting another user. I believe our clients, the author and users, are forgotten in our process. One of my favourite quotes in this presentation comes from Sarah Allison. 
I love the idea that to some people, the idea that the client is more important than the user is a surprise. Our clients are the people that update their content management systems on a daily basis. If they cannot update and manage their own contents, the websites that we build will simply die. I believe a website with even perfect, near perfect UX will still fail if the authoring user is forgotten. And after all the hours we spend wireframing, prototyping, designing and developing and testing, that's the last thing we want. Educating clients, empathy and communication are hot topics at the moment. I believe we're too comfortable talking to each other. We spend our days on Twitter sharing articles using technical jargon that only we understand. I like nothing more than going to a web meetup and talking sass over beer. This is where I feel most comfortable. It's like I'm with my people, but it's not an appropriate conversation to have outside of that environment. Clients don't need to know about SaaS. They don't need to know about half the technologies we use. They just want websites that work. That websites that work for them, for their business, and their users. So I think we need to stop being so arrogant and take the time to talk to people outside of our industry in a language that they understand. We forget that we're computer literate. I've had a computer for 20 years. I'm used to experimenting and failing, and I probably spend more time failing than I do succeeding. It's second nature to Google a problem and Google it until I hit upon the answer, even if it takes me hours. Internet and websites don't scare me, but I've had clients that are absolutely petrified and it's so easy to forget this. We're too busy of making fun of them on clients from hell to remember what it was like for us when we first started. We forget that we're in a really fortunate position. Does not un understanding our world make people stupid? I believe we should never make people feel stupid if they don't understand our world. This talk is inspired by my own family. I have an aunt and uncle in their 70s who got their first computer and the, the internet for the first time last year. Of course, making websites makes me be able to answer any computer problem. So I was on the receiving end of a lot of phone calls, often even an hour long, and this was a real eye-opener for me. I had to explain the difference between a single click and a double click. I had to think about this because I make clicks without even thinking. I couldn't explain why you would do one over the other or under what circumstances because it was just instinct. I found their language fascinating. They called selecting text making it blue, and I can argue with this because when you highlight text, it does become blue. They also referred to deleting text as rubbing it out, so if, if the backspace was acting like a rubber. Discussing our terminology is a different talk, but it does make you think. When did these words become embedded in us? Does our language even make sense outside of our industry? And does it, even make, does it make the entry level to our industry even harder than it should? In terms of clients, I have a different experience each time. I've had one client ring me up and say her website was down three days after launch. She said she could only access it through the long address I gave her, which obviously was a URL. She thought Google was the internet, and of course after three days her site was an index, so when she searched for her name she couldn't find it. I've also had another client that wasn't great with emails. I could send over wireframes and specifications, but the only way to, get, to move forward with the project was to sit her down with a cup of tea and talk her through it. Even if I said exactly the same that was in the specification, she only understood in person. I think it's really interesting to think about being a client. This summer, I've learned to stop being a jack of all trades. I could easily sell all of these services and do half of them averagely, but this doesn't benefit me or my clients. It's taken me a long time to realise where my strengths lie and hire people that are better and smarter than I am where I have weaknesses. I'm currently in the process of rebranding, and in my head I had this idea that I wanted this amazing hand-drawn, curly, lettered logo. I kidded myself that I could start lettering for the first time and I'd come up with an amazing idea. That I had this undiscovered skill that even though I didn't spend any of my time sketching, I could still do it and still be the next Jessica Hitch. Eventually I came to my senses and hired a graphic designer friend of mine. He spends his days creating custom logos, but this was a big challenge for me this year. To trust him to understand what I want when maybe I wasn't even entirely sure myself and to deliver it was hard. I found not being in control difficult and letting also letting go of real challenge. But this is one of my best friends. 
I know his work, I know him, and I trust him. Yet being his client terrifies me, and still does because the project's not finished. Even though I knew how to brief him, and I knew how to create a mood board, he still had to tell me in his words at one point, back the hell off, when I suggested I choose my own sans serif typeface. I found giving feedback very difficult, especially to articulate what I was thinking. Yet I'm used to receiving feedback, and I know what feedback is helpful to me. I expect my clients to give me clear direction and good feedback, but I was worried I'd give him the wrong feedback or even offend him. This makes me wonder how on earth do clients feel? Clients that know absolutely nothing about hiring a web designer or what they want from a website. How are they going to trust a random designer or an agency when there's thousands to choose from? This is why I think we need to develop skills beyond being a good designer and developer. Sure, there's space in a large agency for someone to have no interaction with a client, but if you're a freelancer or communicating with clients, you need to be able to hold a conversation. And a conversation that's not full of technical jargon. You need to learn how to have empathy and consider how you would feel being a client. <coughs> I saw this on clients from hell. And yes, I'll admit it's funny, because to me, I know this a, a transparent element will show the background. But I wonder, does it take more effort to explain someone to, for someone to explain the issue than it does to actually make fun of them? I've had a client struggle to upload an avatar to Twitter. She wanted to save the logo I'd emailed her into a Word document and then upload that. But rather than making fun of her, I talked her through the process. She was so pleased when it worked, she called me a genius. But it's such a basic thing, customising a Twitter profile, and it's something that we take for granted, but to her it meant the world. We need to find the common ground and find out how much our clients actually understand. We need to remember that we're not an expert in their field, so why should they be in ours? We probably only understand a tenth of their business, so it's our responsibility to meet them at their level and increase their technology, te technology knowledge. We need to remember that clients are going to have less knowledge in us, and that's the point. If they didn't, they wouldn't hire us, and they'd make the website themselves. Why do I feel so strongly about this? Throughout this talk on my own business, I refer to web design as a service. I believe we are a customer service industry, and websites happen to be a product of our process. If a client wanted a website that was only a product, they'd go to one-on-one, -on -one, or the local freelancer that creates websites for £100. I think we should provide clients with a customer service and tools for them to be in control. We build using content management systems now to avoid dark ages of, of us making text edits, because now that's the authoring job's user's job. We want to concern ourselves with things like writing pre-processed functions and modules. And we know launching a website isn't the end of the relationship. In fact, maybe it's only the start of the process. And maybe, again, maybe launch is another term that we misuse and we apply to the finished product. Either way, we should provide clients with a customer service and tools. We can't guarantee that our clients will update their websites, but we need to make sure they have the tools if they choose to. I don't think we should be ashamed of the fact that we're in a customer service industry. Granted, a dog owner wouldn't go to a vet and tell the vet what's wrong with their own pet. This is something that we need to address. The fact that anybody with a copy of Dreamweaver or has a book on SEO thinks they're an ex expert in web design and development. There will be clients out there that expect us just to be pixel pushers. Hopefully, hopefully by speaking out through blog posts, attending conferences, and aligning ourselves with experts in our industry, i.e. becoming experts by association, we can show that we're different from that 13-year-old nephew a client has. If not, clients soon learn the hard way that if you buy cheap, you buy twice. It does, however, make our lives more difficult, especially if, we, if the clients have had a bad previous experience. But like any industry in the customer service, and customer service there's something that, that's something that we need to deal with. When you provide customer service, this brings up the question of how long to offer support for and the nature of that support. Explaining the difference between a web browser and Google was appropriate for, and part of my job, but showing someone how to switch on a computer isn't. Once we're communicating, we need to learn, find out how best our clients learn. The same piece of information can be communicated through text, diagrams, graphs, charts, maps, symbols and icons. 
This is graphic communication where we communicate using graphic elements. We use visuals to convey a message, instruction or an idea. We need to discover which visual method works best for each client and also which communication method. Some clients may need more one-to-one -one meetings and be reassured by body language and eye contact. Others may be fine with direct communication methods like email or phone calls. Again, we have a variety of methods to choose from. Some clients may want formal presentations, others may be fine to grab a pint down the pub with you. But we must do our best to hold their hands and ensure through our various communication channels that they actually understand. Maybe we should take the time to understand if our clients are extroverts or introverts to know which, which, which is the best communication method for them. Extroverts like to communicate face to face over the phone in large groups. They have a tendency to think out loud. Whereas introverts prefer emails, text message and one-to-one -one conversations. They may even need time to reflect before answering questions. We also must consider if, if as developers and designers we are introverts or extroverts, but we must adapt to our clients. If you are an introvert and prefer sending emails but have a client that's an extrovert, you need to get, let go of your own preference and meet them face, or face to face and have a <coughs> phone conversation because they are more important than you are. And also being aware of theories like Myers-Briggs might be an advantage. The questionnaire is designed to measure psychological preferences in how people perceive the world and make decisions. The theory argues that there are four psychological functions by which we, we experience the world. These are sensation, intuition, feeling and thinking. Only one of these four functions can be dominant most of the time. The Myers-Briggs type indicator argues that we all have preferences in the way that we construe experiences and these underlie our interests, needs, values and motivation. Understanding if our clients have a preference for thinking or feeling may alter the way we communicate with them. We also need to make sure that we develop our listening skills and actually listen rather than about thinking about what we're going to say next, that we focus on the message that our clients are trying to convey. Even if we are communicating with our clients, we still need to learn the art of explanation. Because we explain so many things on a regular basis, we take the art for granted. It's something that just happens. We never step back to think what actually makes a good explanation. But if we take more time to make our sure our, our explanations, make our, make our ideas come to life, invite our clients to care as much as we do, and be motivated to learn more. When explaining, I always try to even think about my imaginary rubber duck or someone like my dad, who's a bit of a technophobe, has never sent me a text in his life. We forget that explanation is an essential skill that needs to be learned and mastered. We all have the ability to explain. We do it free, so frequently we don't think about it. We think the way in which we do it is normal, and we never consider that it could be improved. But improvement is possible and will create even more positive results. We need to remember that an explanation is not a description, a definition, an instruction, an elaboration, a report or an illustration. It is in fact a set of statements constructed to describe a set of facts which clarifies the causes, context and consequences of those facts. Basically an explanation describes the facts in a way that makes them understandable. The intent of one is to create understanding. Granted, I'm talking about clients as if they're perfect, we all know they're not. We've all experienced fiction and scope creep, we've all experienced them asking for the world on an impossible deadline with no budget, but that's still different to how we treat them. Regardless of how annoyed or upset I can be, I always try to be patient and polite by communication. It may be cheesy, but I always try to deliver my service with a smile. I do this because I want to keep a good relationship. It's not their fault if they're uneducated to our world. They've had a different life to ours, and maybe they've never commissioned a website before, so they don't know how to be a good client. We need to teach them how to be a good client. If we do get clients from hell, maybe that's the result of our own actions. And we need to be careful that we don't take advantage of their lack of knowledge, that we don't baffle them with, with technology in order to browbeat them into making a decision that we're fighting for. That attitude helps no one. We might be overlooking their knowledge because we feel that we know best, but do we? We also need to make sure that we're firm with our clients and they don't try and take advantage of us and our good nature. We also need to remember that we don't have to work for a client if we don't choose to. 
We have the power to say no. And saying no is actually my favourite thing to do this year. It's a skill that's taken me four years to learn out of fear of the fast and, fam fast and famine syndrome that freelancers suffer from. We need to remember that it's not the end of the world if the relationship doesn't work out. Maybe it's simply a clash of personalities. You win some, you lose some. I'm a firm believer that, that, that there is plenty of work out there, especially if you're good, you work hard, and you want it. The process should, should be a collaboration. Clients know their users better than we do, and we know how to create better websites better than they do. It could be dangerous if a client trusts us implicitly, i.e. you're the expert, you know best, because they still have valuable knowledge about the client that we can't even begin to imagine. Collaboration should lead to a better product than one that we're proud of. It should create a happy client who will happily update their content. Once again, it's so easy to forget that they're the ones that have to maintain the websites we create. And as much as we're concerned about the perfect user experience, we still need a happy client. Again, we need to remember that our clients have chosen to work with us over our competitors. They have trusted us. So it's our responsibility not to let them down. We need to show them that they would have liked to place their trust in us in the first place. All of this does take time, and I'd be naive to say it didn't. Our jobs are difficult enough just to build the websites we do on, the, on meeting our deadlines, so managing clients is another aspect that sucks our time. We need to build into timescales all the emails, phone calls, and meetings necessary. We need to overestimate if we have to, because it's easy to underestimate how much support our client will actually need. But the most important thing is that the client gets a good service, because this leads to repeat work and referrals, and at the end of the day, we want more work, and I'm not ashamed to admit this. In terms of Drupal, I'll be honest, and it's a bit of a nightmare for clients to update. Last winter, I built a website for a friend of mine. We both agreed that it was going to be a portfolio piece, but we spent weeks arguing about which CMS to use. He'd had two previous WordPress websites and liked the back-end interface, but he'd had a bad experience of a Drupal 7 website of mine, because I used 7 possibly earlier than I should have done. I eventually had to ask him whether he wanted an amazing front-end experience for his potential bribes, and a not so great experience, also an experience for him, or whether he wanted an average website like every other wedding photographer out there with a brilliant, awesome experience for him. I had to make him choose between a good experience for him or his users. I should not have had to have this conversation. We have an amazing Drupal community. There's documentation, tutorials, videos, conferences, sprints, active forums, and IRC that all aid our development. We can create amazing websites then we shouldn't have to choose whether a system is good for the end user, the author and user, or a developer. A good CMS needs to meet the needs of all three. Usability was an afterthought until Drupal 7, and we need to stop having the attitude, if you don't find Drupal usable, maybe Drupal isn't for you. We need to listen to the people that use Drupal every day, because the more time we spend holding their hands shows that we aren't doing our jobs well enough yet, and neither is Drupal. At the moment for my clients, I always install the admin menu. I create an admin user role with only the basics necessary to update the website. I disable views, blocks, content types, and th so they don't have access to anything they can break. I do give them the super administrator role, but I usually use the line, with great power comes great responsibility. I hammer home the point, if they break anything under that user role, I will charge for it. I choose a thing that's not Bartic, usually seven, but I'm thinking switching to shiny. I use CK Editor to disable the majority of the styles. I only allow my clients to boldly italic the text, add links, headings, and images via IMCA. I always create a user manual with screen chat, chat, chat captures, taking clients through the process of adding and editing content. Whenever I train clients, I always suggest they bring their own laptop. Rather than showing them how to perform functions, I talk them through it. Otherwise, I have a tendency to go too quickly because I know my way around the back end because I've spent X amount of time developing it. They need to go at their own speed and one that they're comfortable with. I encourage them to make their own notes, as in a month's time they're more likely to understand their words than mine. There are plenty of other options, including using a custom dashboard, vertical tabs while editing, and custom admin toolbars and overlays. You need to find out what works best for your clients, and this should be tailored for each individual project, project and client. Hopefully Drupal 8 is making more steps to address the end user experience. The introduction of Spark in-place editing should reduce the amount of time required to make the back end, end user friendly and provide a better experience for non-technical content maintainers. We need Drupal to encourage clients to maintain their content rather than fight against them. 
Only time will tell if Spark doesn't just make Drupal seem easy to you, but use, but actually makes it, makes a difference. Some people may say to me that I need to find better clients with a high level of understanding or ditch their client work altogether. But I like client work and the constraints it brings. I like teaching someone who's never seen a CMS before how to add a new page or a link. And I love that light bulb moment when they realise it's not as difficult as they first imagined. I agree with Laura that we shouldn't be unusual for saying this and for saying that we don't want to work with the latest startup or the latest hit project. I would honestly rather work with clients and form long-lasting relationships. Interestingly, a local Derby managing director, Oliver, wrote his, this blog post entitled Why I Gave Up Web Design After 10 Years. And I have a lot of respect for him for saying this. At the height of his company, Silk Type Success, they had 200 clients and 15 members of staff. But he found the, the, the industry ate away of his soul, so gave it all up to make products. In his blog, he argued how easy, maybe too easy, what web design was to get into. All you, after all, all you need is a laptop, an internet connection, and time. But he always found that he was at the whim of his clients, and he argued that maybe we, should, we shouldn't keep our clients happy for the sake of keeping them happy and paying our bills. He admitted that he had had to fly, fire clients over the, over the years, but he couldn't fire every client that disagreed with him. He argued that we probably take on work that we know we shouldn't, and in the end, you end up sacrificing your ideals because the alternative is worse. And no matter how much great work you do, it's not the work you choose to do. You're always working for someone else. He took nine months to get out of the web design industry and now has products like Sitebeam, Sightray and Nibbler because he only wanted to answer to himself. I realise Oliver completely contradicts everything I've said so far. And again, I will say I have a lot of respect for him because web design is a very and neither is working with clients, but we forget that we have a choice. If we don't want to work in a customer service industry, we don't have to. I really believe we can find a happy medium between keeping both ourselves and our clients happy. We also need to remember that some people concentrate on being a good web designer, designer and make a career from it, whilst others may make a living from it but want to be great somewhere else. To the latter people, web design isn't a career, it's simply a job that pays the bills. And that's fine, everyone's different. Not everyone wants to spend the weekend at a conference learning from others and talking about our work. But hopefully it makes us, the people that care, and the people that care about providing an excellent service, stand out from a crowded marketplace. Just going to skip a few slides. Not everyone agrees with everything I said. I was down at Brighton at Deconstruct in September, and there was a talk about inputs. When the map was first introduced, we had the input of the mouse and the keyboard. And Luke argued it take tw taken 29 years for us to figure out how to use these. And soon we'll be using inputs and manipulations in our future work. And that's, and eventually every object could be an input. I had a discussion with another designer about these in inputs and my forgotten user talk. He argued that some clients need to be left behind. If they couldn't manage to update websites or use the internet using a mouse and keyboard, we shouldn't let them hold us back. Well, we want to push the boundaries and develop some new inputs. This infuriated me. Because yes, I think there's a point, and maybe for some people, updating a website is a step too far. But I'd rather try and fail than give up altogether. I've seen some developers recommend verbal Squarespace to these sorts of clients. But from personal experience, Squarespace sucks. This summer, I've learned Omega, SAS, Compass, Git, and Drops, but I've never wanted to throw my computer out the window more than when I was making a Squarespace site. The interface, the lack of support, the lack of documentation made it almost impossible. So maybe these sorts of clients like, need designers like me to work with, they need, need a relationship with a human being rather than given the lazy, maybe not appropriate option of Squarespace. Why do I do all of this? Some of you may think I go above and beyond, but by being patient and having empathy, I add value to a person's business. And as they grow into larger businesses, they continue to use my services. I become a valued business partner and then, then, then they recommend me to others. In the four years I've been freelancing, I've never once had to advertise for work or ask for it. It's always found me. It doesn't matter if I work for Nike or the local plumber, every client deserves the same good experience when working with a web designer. I really believe that every website I build, I build to the best of my abilities regardless of the client. One of my favourite websites to date is for a business that cleans, cleans driveways. It's not glamorous, but it's a damn good response to the build. A peer of mine was amazed when I listed this website in my portfolio. He asked me if I realised if, if the website was for a business that cleans driveways. I said I'm well aware of this fact, but I'm proud of my work. 
I also have a happy client. His business has been successful and growing. And next month, he's working with me again as he's starting a new business. This was an unusual client because I, I've never met him in person. In fact, I only had one telephone call with him, and all the other co communications have occurred through email. So I'm pleased he still continues to use my services. Too many clients have had bad experiences and have a chip on their shoulder for the next work designer. This can be changed if we take the time to, to guide them through the process through good communication, education, and have some patience. This ensures the websites we build are maintained by the author and user and that the end users continue to receive the experience we've designed. We're too quick to forget that client work pays our bills and it's a scary world for some. Therefore, we need to stop forgetting clients and start seeing them as users and do our best to ensure that our clients have the tools to update their websites. We need to remember to be grateful and humble that we actually have clients, and that clients that want and choose to work with us, they don't have to. We don't need a world of forgotten users and a web of obsolete and out-of-date websites. We need happy clients because that in turn makes us happy. Thank you. I've got them online for, for you to see. Hi. You, you talked a lot about happy clients mm. and forgotten users, but you didn't really <coughs> say a lot about workflow okay. on the client side. Yeah. So do, do, you, do you have a story to share about what clients do when you're not there? And I believe we should have bought shit. I'm always honest, if I can't do something, I will tell them I can't do something, I will look into it. I never over-promise, because I, I always try and, and I always try and over-deliver. Um, I think honesty is a huge key in this, because then you trust us. And in terms of workflow, I always try and keep in contact, I always know, let them know what stage I'm at, what I need from them on what time scale. But do they do that for you? No. <laughs> I, I'm, try, I mean, I'm trying, and there's only at some point that you can say, I need this content for this day. And, but clients just don't like writing content. You know? But I, I have a policy now that I never start the design until I have the content. So I have a fair few projects at the store, but the ones that feed back to me, they get their websites a lot quicker. My, my policy at the moment is, first come first serve. So if you can get the content and the information to me, you bump up my to-do list. And, yeah. Hi. Um, uh, you said that your the sites you do are, are relatively small. Yeah. Isn't Drupal a bit of an overkill? I say no, because a lot, I tend to work with clients as, as startups and as they grow. So I build the basic and the framework, so then in six months' time they'll come back to me and say, my business is growing, I need X, Y, and Z. So then it's more expandable. And I also find in my area there's a lot of WordPress de developers. So by doing throughput, I stand out from the crowd, I have less competition. Right, because your, your clients aren't really going to be interested in they don't whether care. it's Drupal or WordPress. No, they just want it to work. Yeah. And as long as Drupal works for them, yeah. and, for, and I future-proof it, that's all that matters to them. I've been lucky so far that I haven't been in that position. I, I think that we have to have a bit of leniency because they've been probably some of my clients have never even seen a content management system before. So I can't expect them after half an hour with me to know what to do. But after I sit down with them the first time, the next time it's probably just a phone call. Oh, I, I can't remember how to add this, or I can't remember how to delete that. But I do find that by when I train them, when I, if they are on their own laptop and I'm sat opposite them, that sits in their head a lot quicker than me quickly, or do this, do that, do that. Because I do it so quickly, I don't think about it. But if they're sat opposite, doing it at their speed, then it does sink in a lot quicker. Do you find that you need to then set aside more time to training? 
it's part of my um, uh, like time scale. I will set X amount of hours for training and writing and using language. I'm um, guessing the answer is no, but have you ever sat to clients? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I shouldn't be excited when I said that. I that. <laughs> so, no, I, I have sat to client, yes. And then there's a point. Um, I'm only nice for so long. <laughs> I mean, I'm a nice person, but I do have a point. Hi. Hi, I was so just on the back of this gentleman's question. Um, do you have to factor in a lot extra sort of cost-wise? Because uh, sort of, you seem to obviously do a lot of uh, probably more training than most people do. Um, have you found it difficult to sell that to the client, or do you even sell it? Do you just sort of do it as standard and include it in the cost of your work? You know, how I, do you sort of balance that? I include it in my cost of my work, but don't tell them that okay. half is that, that is due to training. Sure. Is that quite difficult to, to include? I mean, I suppose everyone in this room knows how difficult it is sure. to sell web design to a client. Especially, I mean, there's freelancers in Derby that'll do it for 100 quid. Sure. But nine times out of ten, I end up cleaning up their work six months. Yeah. Hi. Hi. It kind of follows on really quite well. I suppose, do you have, do you find that you have like a core set of tools that you use for most of the sites so that training gets easier? Yeah. Uh, I, I have a standard yeah. template that I edit on every single for every client. Same set of modules. So yeah. I think that's all we have time for. But thank you very much. <laughs>